Welcome to the first 50 years program for the Harris Center. My name is Susie Spickle and I'll kind of be working with Jeremy tonight to MC this event. Um, this is really exciting. It's so nice to see you even though you're in little boxes. Um, I recognize lots of familiar faces and um, it's it's exciting that we can get together this way um, when it's been such a hard kind of time in our world. Um, it's nice to see everybody. And tonight, it's really nice to celebrate um, 50 years with the Harris Center. And um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have some stories tonight from people that were here from the beginning. We're going to talk about um, the Harris Center's kind of evolution and where we're going in the future. So exciting. And I should just say that the kind of idea behind this program came from a book that we are putting out for our 50th year, a commemorative book. Um, and we're going to be highlighting that book tonight. Um, through a slideshow and, and kind of featuring it. Um, and if you're interested in finding out how to get that book, we're going to tell you how to do that at the end tonight. But it is on our website under our 50th tab. But we'll, we'll go over that tonight. So to get started, I thought it would be great if we could um, introduce all the Harris Center speakers for this evening. And of course, it's my great honor to start off with the reason the Harris Center even exists is Eleanor Briggs. And Eleanor, can you kind of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I um, thought I'd be share a little bit about how we got started with all of this. Uh, way back in the dark ages when I was a child, I found that going out in the woods uh, was very comforting and climbing trees was really exciting. And nature on the North Shore of Long Island and New Hampshire really was an endless playground. Then as a teenager, I saw my Long Island paradise get paved over because it was just too close to New York City, 41 miles away. So in the 60s, I feared that the same fate was going to happen to our Monadnock region. And then in 1969, I was given a chance to form an organization to address this fear so with a group of friends, we decided that education was the best way to inspire everybody to appreciate where we live. Because many people who grew up here and grow up here really don't realize how special this region is. Um, not having seen some of the other parts of the world where planning didn't go so well. Anyway, um, with this new organization, I really wanted to touch every member of the Monadnock community from one to 100 and get them all to fall in love with where we are. Because I figured that if they did this, it would cause people to learn about where we live and then they might want to protect it, I hoped. And I wanted to have this organization be completely local with its focus on the Monadnock region. Not the state, not the country, not the world, but just the Monadnock region. Because I figured that with our limited resources, that's how we could be most powerful. So I convinced a dear neighbor, a retired diplomat called Cecil Lyon, to become the director of this infant organization. He actually thought I'd asked him to become a director um not the director but being good natured he accepted and we set to work forming a board of directors i called this organization the harris foundation after my beloved cat harris who had led me on many woodland adventures we hired our first staff person john coolish um, John had been a hunter and a trapper for many decades, but had hung up his traps, as he said, because he saw a tremendous decline in the animals that he hunted. John knew more about the woods than almost any biologist, and so began programs in the local public schools to get the, uh, the students outside. Even on overnight camping trips in February, I joined one at Rob Reservoir, where we made our own lean-to and um, melted snow for tea and had a lot of other things to eat also. It was really wonderful. 
He also led rigorous bushwhacking and snowshoe hikes on weekends for adults. Cecil and I also looked for speakers. And one of our first speakers was Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist whose daughter lived at the time in uh, Hancock, uh, Catherine Bateson. Margaret Mead suggested we change our name because we, we expressed huge shock at the size of her speaker's fee when she said what she wanted us to pay her. We said we weren't the kind of foundation that gives out money. We did things with money. And so the Harris Foundation was rechristened the Harris Center for Conservation Education. A thousand people showed up that night to hear Margaret Mead speak uh, in Conval's auditorium, which holds 200 people. So we changed, went to the gym, and um, it was a very successful event. I served on, as chair of the board for 18 years, which was another kind of an education for me. Um, I'd never been head of a board, but uh, was coached by an expert, Bill Hart. And every meeting, um, when things started to go slightly off track, Bill would start shuffling his papers noisily, and I'd get the signal and pull things back to the subject at hand. Then in our fifth year, 1975, with great relief, Cecil Lyon was able to retire to become a director when we hired the knowledgeable and creative Dr. Mead Cadeau as director. So, to be continued. Oh, that's great. Um, wow. And we're going to see some slides that will show some pictures of the things that Eleanor was talking about. But, Mead, um, Eleanor, pass the torch to you. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I, I, would, I should say that when, when Cecil was desperate to find a replacement for himself, he did a <laughs> wide job search. He searched all Willard Pond and all the naturalists that were living there. And I was the one that was selected. And I was the only one. So um, anyway, I, I was glad to step in. It was a great learning experience for me, too. I mean, the, in the beginning, I don't know what I, when you want me to stop or when you, what you want me to say here, but in the beginning, a lot of it was about getting visibility for the Harris Center. And one of the things that we learned early on, and we still know, is if we could get critters here in the flesh, that was always a big draw. We get a lot of people come, whether it be a fish or a bobcat or a bear. And that reminded me, reminded me of the time that one of my students at Antioch, where I was teaching then, and did for many years, showed up from Hiram, Ohio, with a pet coyote. So you can believe we took advantage of that. You always said I'm a coyote, Susan. And so we took advantage of that, <laughs> that incident. And we had a, we advertised the program all about the controversial coyote. And we had so many people come to the Harris Center. We had to relocate downtown and have it in the vestry. But it was, that was a lot of fun. Everything we did at the Harris Center was a lot of fun. Eleanor had some great fundraising ideas. We had parties, we had we celebrated the seasons. You know, it was all great fun. And, you know, gradually over the time, I moved on to other things like learning about forest management and, and wildlife management, that sort of thing. And then eventually on to land protection. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Mead. That was great. I do call Mead a coyote. He, he is sort of my coyote totem. He, he's so good at finding opportunities for the Harris Center. And, and it's been, and I've learned so much about mammals from, from me that seems like a good, a good name for him, Coyote. Um, let's have Jeremy, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I, uh, I, I just was in a meeting the other day and had to say that this is my eighth year and I couldn't believe it. I'm, I'm still in shock about that uh, at, at the Harris Center. Um, I, Susie and I are gonna be talking a lot during the presentation, so I don't wanna say too much at, at this point, but it's great to have everyone here and hopefully you'll enjoy looking at some of the pages of this book with us. Thanks, Jeremy. And let's have um, Lisa Murray, if you can introduce yourself. 
Hi, I'm Lisa Murray. I'm the outreach manager here. I've been here for about a year and a half. In some ways it feels like just a minute's gone by and in other ways it seems like about 25 years because <laughs> I feel that in a good way. I mean, it just feels like I, I know so many people. I've known people from different walks of life because I've, I've lived in Temple for 30 years and um, it's just such a great organization and so much fun to be part of it. Thank you, Lisa. And we'll have Margaret. If you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Hi, I'm Margaret Baker, and I um, do the commu print communications for the Hair Center. And I uh, was lucky enough to get to design the book that you'll see, or slides that you'll see later. Um, I've been here for seven years, which is also shocking. And it's just a real joy to be able to work with all the photos and the stories um, um, that abound at, this, at the Hair Center. It's, my job is very easy because I have great material to work with. Happy to be here. That's great, Margaret. Thank you. I am um, Brett Thielen. I know that you didn't sign up to be part of tonight's talk, but you're here. So it'd be great if you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hi, I'm Brett. I'm our science director. I coordinate our citizen science programs and work with undergraduates and graduate students to do conservation research on our protected lands. And I also, um, on the side, I'm, I'm, I'm on the editorial team. So I help to edit uh, a number of our publications and our web stuff, including the book that we're going to enjoy soon. Thanks, Brett. And Miles. Hello, everybody. I'm Miles office manager at the Harris Center, trying to keep things running smoothly there for events like this and uh, keeping the building nice and clean on the inside. I know you can't see it, but it looks very nice. <laughs> I'm in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to um, share um, the slides from the book or pictures from the book and kind of talk about the history. So um, Jeremy, if you want to start with um, the first slide. This is really um, was an exciting project to work on and I'm going to ask Lisa to talk about um, about this project and what we're going to be seeing tonight and kind of the intention behind it. So Lisa. Okay well we're really excited to launch this newest addition to our lineup of 50th anniversary merchandise items. Uh, this is our 50th anniversary commemorative book it highlights the Harris Center points of growth through the decades, as well as some of the key people who have been involved in birthing and nurturing this organization over the past 50 years. The bulk of the content of the book was created by Susie Spickle, Brett Thielen, Sandy Taylor, Margaret Baker, and myself, much of which was culled from our photo archives, and Margaret did the graphic design of the book. We hope you enjoy it and feel really proud to be part of this history and the future of the Harris Center as well. Thanks, Lisa. It's going to be really exciting um, to go through it and share. We had a lot of fun working on this, thinking about all the images we had and what to express about the 50th. And in real, in, in my heart, I wish this was like in front of, a, of you all and, and we could all be together. Um, but since it's digital, we'll, we'll have to do our best. So let's see what's the next page, a blip. Um, so uh, yeah, this is the mission of the Harris Center and um, I feel really lucky to have been working at the Harris Center for over 25 years now. This mission really speaks to me and it's a lot of words, but when I boil it down, I always just feel, and I think Eleanor said it the best, um, the real mission of the Harris Center in my heart is to help people really fall in love with this place that we live in right here. And um, we do that in so many different ways um, through land protection and education and research and lots of programs that get people outside. Jeremy, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, th I think that's a beautiful way to say it. And I think it makes us a really interesting organization that there, there aren't many others like us in the in, in New Hampshire and for that matter the, the country um, that combine this this strong educational element with with land protection and, and that now conservation research is our newest program now. That's great. So true. 
All right. So Eleanor, this was your house. This was your summer home. And I know you, you told us the kind of story, but um, can you tell us a little bit, what was it like for you to come to this place and spend your summers? How did it feel to you? Oh, it was so wonderful. I would come to be with my father and my grandmother and, um, and I'd be able to go out into the woods. My, my bedroom was on the upper left-hand corner with the screen porch. And I'd open the windows and the smell of ripe grapes would come wafting in because the front of the house was covered with grapevines. So it was just, um, it was a wonderful uh, time submerged in nature. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I love imagining you out on that porch as a young person smelling the grapes and kind of being kind of enraptured by the outdoors. Uh, I have a similar background where I grew up in Brooklyn and we would go to Vermont every summer. And I think it was my summer experiences that left their biggest mark on me as a person and ended mm -hmm. me up at the Harris Center. So I can relate. And I'm sure, I know Mead, you've talked about how those summer experiences for children are so important. They sure are. And, and what, you know, we'll be talking about Wells Nest later, but it, one of the things that's great about Wells Nest is seeing kids come back and with their own kids and grandparents of kids hosting kids while they go to Wells Nest. So the Harris Center has played a big role in helping that experience for lots of families. Well said, well said. Let's see, what's on the next page? It's hard, I don't have the control. I'm gonna give Jeremy a signal. Oh, so Eleanor, um, can you tell us about the cat? Not the bobcat, but who is that fella? That's, that's my cat Harris who, um, I found in a deserted building in, on 84th Street in New York City as a kitten and rescued him and was looking around for somebody to give a cat to because I never thought I really wanted one when I realized after three days that I couldn't give him away. And, uh, and so he traveled with me up to New Hampshire and was a very wise and friendly uh, guide in the woods and at home. He's just a wonderful animal um, to, to spend time with. And this was by a rather famous photographer, El, um, Erica Lenard, who photographed him back in probably 1980, something like that. Wow. And mm. did you name him Harris? I heard, always heard he had like a Harris tweed fur. Yes, that's why he was named Harris, because <laughs> he, he had this black and gray uh, coat and a, a, a sort of a tweedy pattern, which I thought was absolutely unique. And then when I was in um, Thailand, I saw one just like him. <laughs> it was quite, it's quite a common uh, cat pattern for domestic short hairs. I guess so. He was uncommon, but I loved working at the Harris Center for part of the reason is the mystery of its name. Um, and people always send letters to Mr. Harris or Mrs. <laughs> Harris or, um, and for a long time, we kept a list of all the funny ways that we got mail addressed with really? the word Harris. And me, do you have like one or two that you just thought were the funniest ones? Oh, well, how about the Harris Center for Conservative Education? <laughs> or, <laughs> or, Mead, how the about Harris the- Harris Center. How about the Harris Center for Conversation Education? That's right. That's another one. The list is still there. It's still on, I think it's, it's somebody's got the desk upstairs. It still has that list. It's so and What I think about this, the Harris thing is I always end up by saying, so what we're really named after is an island off the coast of Scotland. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, people are always so excited to find out it was named after a cat and to see the picture, at least the kids I work with. They love that. Um, they love that mystery. And it's neat that it morphed into a bobcat, which is um, a great symbol for the, um, the super sanctuary, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. 
Okay, so this was the first naturalist. This is the, the famous John Coolish, and um, he was the author of a book, Bobcats Before Breakfast, along with his wife, I know they co-wrote it or worked on it together. And um, Eleanor talked a little bit about um, John's hikes, but I wonder if Mead and Eleanor, if you have anything you would like to share about hiking with John or knowing him or spending time with him, because he was a, had a strong, um, he was had a strong personality. Well, I can remember him asking uh, Cindy and I if we wanted to take a little walk. And 13 miles later, we <laughs> collapsed exhausted back at the cabin where, where we were staying. He was a, he was quite a quite a hiker. And the other thing about John is, you know, he had, he had, he was quite a raconteur. He loved to tell stories, and all you had to do was start the first couple of words, and, and you'd hear the story. It was almost like, uh, you know, you push a button. Um, but what he really did do very well was know his university materials. He knew his University of the Woods better than anybody. And this picture that you show here shows him standing next to a beech tree in the Perse Reservation, our largest conservation easement now, I believe. And the thing that's interesting about that is it's got bear claw marks on it. And believe me, in 1980, there were hardly any trees around here that had bear claw marks on them. But John knew exactly where everyone was. Wow. Eleanor, is there anything you would like to add? <laughs> well, you know, he um, he did have an incredible sense of humor, and um, there was a, a um, wonderful story about when he used to guide hunters, and um, he was guiding this man who was hunting deer, and he had a um, a little bunch of black olives in his pocket, and he uh, put them down in the snow and pointed and the the his client didn't notice this and then he pointed to them and the client looked and saw and he said yep that's deer scat and and the client said really and and what about it and so john picked up one of the olives and popped it into his mouth <laughs> chewed it and said yep it was a female and she was going that way <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> I love that story. He was hysterical. I mean, he had the funniest sense of humor and he had this big goofy laugh. Oh, that's so sweet. And and he I love the book Bobcats Before Breakfast and I'll just put a pitch in for that book. Um it was out of print for a really long time and it was hard to get. You could, you'd have to go on eBay and it would be like $60, $75. Um, but this year for the 50th anniversary, the Harris Center um, worked with the original publisher, Stackpole Press, and we were able to have it republished. And, and it's available at the Toadstool to purchase or through the Harris Center. And if you haven't read it, his sense of humor comes through, his grit comes through, um, and his incredible knowledge of uh, the University of the Woods really shines through. So um, check it out if you haven't checked it out before. Oh, Mead Cado. That's Jeremy, that was, you wanna ask me some questions? Well, just a quick question. So you started in 1975. What was the, uh, what was your work like when you first started at the Harris Center? We're gonna talk about land protection in, in a few minutes, but when you first started, what was it, what was it like? I'm going to throw it back at you, Jeremy. I remember when you first started working here, you would say, it's complicated. Well, back then it wasn't so complicated. <laughs> but it was very, as I said earlier, it was a very interesting learning experience. And I, I was able to dabble in all sorts of things, um, teaching people things that I had learned the day before, kind of that way of going about it. and. Um, it was, it was all great fun. We had great fun at the Harris Center, and still do. So um, the true heart of the Harris Center um, is the education that takes place there. And it really is 
because um, I always like to kind of frame it as Mead has told me, um, lifespan. He, he, Mead, you like to call it cradle to grave, but it's not so nice. So now we change that to lifespan. So we have really young people like babies and backpacks all the way up through um, people even in assisted living and memory care that we work with. It is truly lifespan and it is all about this place. And we do so many things um, working from the schools, and I think that's the next picture. Um, working in all of the schools that we work in, which um, 3,000 students every year that we um, connect with in 30 different schools, really helping kids make a local connection to their science standards, their math standards, their um, history standards, and even their writing and literature standards. Um, and we do it pretty much all outside, hands-on, um, very exciting. Um, it helps kids all the way from preschool up through high school programs in our um, public schools primarily here in the Monadnock region. And that is such a gift. Um, that is really unique in the universe. Um, and it's been such a joy for me um, to have been working here all these years and to have such a great group of colleagues to work with. We have wonderful educators. Every single one of them has got their, um, their feet in the gr on the ground, their hands in the dirt, and they're right there with the kids. Um, and it it really pays off. We have a lot of people, kids that grow up in this area that carry nature with them in their heart wherever they go. And that's really my goal as a teacher is to put it right in their heart. And our summer camp, um, and many of you might know it as Wool's Nest, um, and, and lots of us still refer to it as that way, but we changed the name because people kept calling it Wasp's Nest and Wolf's Nest and wool, like wool that you knit with nest, but it was originally named after an owl um, from Winnie the Pooh when he misspells his name Wool. And Mead, you know the beginning of Wool's Nest. Wool's Nest has been going on a long time. Tell us the beginning. Well, uh, it goes back to the winter of spring of 1975. I was a resident naturalist at Willard Pond at the time, and I was teaching at the Antioch Graduate School in what is now Aldworth Manor in Harrison. But I was familiar with the goings on in the grounds of the Harris Center because I had helped at Winnick Tchaikovsky with a couple of teacher workshops there. And then Antioch decided it should move from rural Harrisville to the city of Keene. So it's little experimental day camp called the Wolves Nest needed a home. And, and I thought, well, maybe I could make a match. So I arranged for Ty Minton, the founder and co-chair of the Environmental Studies Department, to meet at the Harris Center with Cecil, uh, the volunteer director. And there was a short walkabout and an even shorter discussion. It was a handshake. And the camp has been here ever since as part of the Harris Center program. And I should say that that also began a very great, long and strong collaboration between two young organizations. Many Antioch graduate students interned with the Harris Center and the Pitkeville, the litter, uh, joined our staff, including Janet Aldabella and you, Susie. And to this day, you are the brain, heart and soul of our school community and family programs. Oh, that's sweet. It's making me cry. I'm glad I'm not really in front of all of you because you would see me get worked up a little bit. That was really sweet, me. Um, a great thing about Wool's Nest, I'll just go back for a moment, um, is that um, since its initial beginning, which was for kind of your classic um, six to like nine year olds, our program for, for our summer programs has really grown. We now work with preschoolers, so you can come to camp when you're four, and we go all the way up through um, kind of uh, kids entering high school, and um, those programs get more and more adventurous. So it's been really fun to watch that program kind of spread its roots out. Um, and we've been getting now, now that camp has been going on a long time, um, we've been getting uh, kids that go through our camp program and come back as instructors, as counselors. And now parents who came to camp as campers are sending their kids to camp. So we really see that legacy of, it, of, of people really connecting to this program. So 
We do a lot of other types of programming um, from all the way from preschools. This is my little friend Loretta and I looking at a little um, thing growing and that's babies in backpacks. Um, all the way up through programs at assisted living facilities. Um, and those programs are often, most often free and open to the public. And that's another thing that's really special about the Harris Center. Um, so many places like the Harris Centers would charge for people to come to these programs. But I took my lead from Mead, um, who always was such an advocate for the idea that People should be able to come and do something and not have to pay outside. Um, and that's really in part of the heart of the Harris Center. And it's really through the gener generous contributions of our supporters that make that really possible that we can sustain that. Um, and it, it's a true gift to our community for all ages. Um, and we do tons of different types of programs. So all the way from after school programs like Lab Girls and Yeti Club to um, demonstrations of, of things that um, biologists might do like bird banding to hikes that are led by an incredible crew of volunteers. We are so fortunate to have such active volunteers that help us lead these amazing hikes um, to lectures, to courses that we teach now in environmental studies Institute as our courses. Um, and who knows, now we're in this new world, we're trying all sorts of new things from Zoom programs to, I don't know what's next, but it's always unfolding. So um, the education piece of the Harris Center is wonderfully dynamic and responsive to what the community needs. And that also is really a special thing about the Harris Center. So over, over the years, Mead could certainly tell us that there were small scale research projects that, that were ongoing from forest management uh, research to environmental education research. But really, I think probably in 2010, 2011, when the Harris Center took over ABIO's program, ABIO stands for the Ashwalet Valley Environmental Observatory. When the Harris Center took over that programming to keep it going, um, we really took on a whole variety of citizen science initiatives and it, it, it sort of put the, the, the sense of wanting to have a conservation research program as part of this, this center uh, into, into the mix for sure. And um, it's, it's been really fun to watch that grow because it's really, it's, I came in 2012, so it, it was just at the beginning of that and it's been, it's been great fun. Where I, this picture is showing me uh, working with a bunch of Keene State College interns every spring, not this spring because of the, the pandemic, but every uh, spring for the last seven years, we've worked with a group of four interns from Keene State College. And it's just been an extraordinary uh, experience for, for us, but also for the interns to, to gain a sense of all kinds of, of research opportunities, but also environmental education. Um, Brett's here, so I wonder if you might say something about our citizen science program which falls under the conservation research. Sorry to do this to you, Brett, but you have it. Putting me on the spot, but I'm happy to talk about it briefly. Um, so citizen science is kind of this trendy way of saying volunteer involvement in scientific research. And it's been going on for easily 100 years with things like the Christmas bird count, but it really took off in the last 20 years or so. And um, Avio that Jeremy mentioned was a program, an organization devoted solely to citizen science in the Monadnock region. And I um, was their science director before I came to the Harris Center. And um, they've started some programs that we continue today that the one that everybody loves and talks about, which was um, a relative of which was in the New York Times this week, is the Salamander Crossing Brigades where people move migrating amphibians off of roads and keep count. Um, and we just, We've, this this um, book went to press before we'd hit the 50,000 amphibian mark, but this season our volunteers moved their 53, 53rd thousand uh, amphibian to safety. So we, it's a pretty amazing program that's been going on for about 15 years and the families and adults come back year after year to do it. Um, we had I think last year 250 people participating in this project and so and we have other projects too 
focusing on wildlife habitat, water quality, endangered bird monitoring, and we're adding new ones um, all the time. So it's a really great way for, you know, I always think that people connect to nature in all different kinds of ways. And for some people it's art or it's literature or it's simply walking in the woods. And for some people it's science. And so it's wonderful that we can offer that too. Thank, thank you, Brett, that's great. Um, so this is our, our, our newest area, but it's, it's, one of, it's one of the really exciting ones in terms of, of some of the things we're doing. Uh, two years ago, we, we joined with, with uh, New Hampshire Audubon to do the, the Raptor Observatory on PAC, um, PAC Monadnock Mountain. And, and uh, that's just been a great experience that we really tried to meld that with our education programs in, in, in a whole variety of different ways and much more to come in this, in this area of, of the Harris Center. So uh, the third leg of the stool, if we have education, we have conservation research, is this, this land conservation, which really got started in I think 1980 was the initial year that the Harris Center was doing any land conservation. It really been education up until that point. Need, I wonder if you could share with us this, the story of, of the sort of area we're looking at right here. I think you have a story about Spoonwood Pond. Sure. Uh, uh, it, it's a very long and complicated story, so I'm going to shorten it for the night. But as of 1984, the Harris Center had successfully protected about 30 acres on the pond, plus the whole shoreline. And uh, as you can see, it's a pristine pond of 150 acres. And Nelson, and most of the land behind the shoreline, rising up to the summit, actually the land where Red is taking, is standing when she took this photograph, lay unprotected and vulnerable. And a big chunk of that unprotected land was called the Green Gate Estate, the home of the elderly and then ailing a new Um And to make a long story short tonight, the 400 plus acres had to be sold. And the price tag, this is 1984, or not. Remember this, way back for us, close to a half a million bucks. That was way beyond our means. I mean, we had been challenged enough to raise 5% of that just to protect the 30 acres we'd already managed to protect. All we could do was hope that the buyer would not be some big time developer, or at least that's what we thought. Then I received word from some folks I hardly knew and who wished to remain anonymous saying they would like to enable us to buy the land. You can imagine how this land trust novice felt when I was handed a check for 495000 in 1985 dollars. Not only were there no strings attached, but the donors also agreed that we could sell the house high up in Osgood, Osgood Mountain with about 30 acres around it. And the proceeds from that sale created our Spoonwood Revolving Land Protection Loan Fund, which to this day is allowing us to protect still more land for the Super Sanctuary. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary story of, of I don't, I don't, it, it, it's amazing. I think you went into land protection with, with a lot of sense of, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know what, what, what feels right. And it, it's well, when we started, the Harris Center had seven acres. So wait till you see the map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's I, I don't have the map, but we we, we do have some um, some uh, just sort of quick quick reference things to just give you a sense of what we've helped helped to protect. So we we passed the twenty four thousand acre mark in January of this of this year, January twenty twenty. So. Needs in, in Mead's time here, we've gone some, from seven acres to 24,000 acres. But in, in that 24,000 acres, we've protected 23 peaks over 1,500 feet in elevation, 95 miles along rivers and streams. And that only counts one side of the river or stream. It's not if it's on both sides. 21 miles of hiking trail, a variety of scenic roads, shorefront surrounding 18 lakes and ponds, and uh, Maybe most importantly, 1,600 acres of diverse wetlands are, are a component of that, of that. 
the uh, the the whole idea behind the, the 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 land protection at the hair center is a little different than most land trusts. It's really focused in a very very small area. We only work in about eight towns, and every project that we do these days is is connected to other conserved lands. So we're really trying to build a backbone of conserved lands that that serves as extraordinary wildlife habitat for species that require really large home ranges and, and uh, relatively unfragmented home ranges. And so it's, it's been an amazing uh, journey for the region. And it's, we've, we've, because of need and, and, and incredible supporters, we've been able to really create this, I call it a backbone of conserved land in the region that, that wasn't provided by the state, and it certainly wasn't provided by the federal government in this region. And yet, the Monadnock region is is rich in conserved land because of the, uh, supporters that have just made made this this kind of activity possible. Can I jump in here a little bit here? Yeah, I think you have a story about the the Sydney Williams Wood. The, the, oh, no, I wasn't going to go there. Actually, I just wanted to. I can, but what I really wanted to say was that you know, in the in the beginning and still now. You know, the Harris Center in our land protection work has always said it's not who protects what, it's what gets protected. And this has allowed the Harris Center to build strong partnerships with our fellow land con conservation organizations. We have, we've been, we had successful collaborations with the Audubon Society, the Nature Conservancy, the Forest Society, Nadnock Conservancy, Town of Hancock. New Hampshire Fish and Game Department, Nelson, Town of Nelson, uh, Town of Hancock, Town of Peterborough. And so we all work on this together. And actually, if you take in the land that uh, our partners have protected, in addition to the R24,000, you add another 12,000 acres. So it's really quite amazing. What I envisioned in the beginning was that, that the super sanctuary was just going to be about creating a super sanctuary, meaning making the Willard Pond Sanctuary big enough to include, you know, the Briggs Preserve and Spoonwood and Osgood Mountain, maybe five or six square miles. And now it's north of 50 square miles. To me, that's really amazing. Yeah, well, well thank you for your vision and all, all the work that went into it. And, and thanks to the supporters who made it all possible. Speaking of, of, of people who have made it all possible, I mean, we've, we've got staff from all the 50 years and an extraordinary group of, of staff and the book does a really nice montage of, of people who have been, been involved in the Harris Center over the years. Um, I think partnerships, needs played that up. It's partnerships on the land conservation level, but it's also partnerships with, with the local schools, it's partnerships with libraries, it's partnerships with every kind of group you can imagine. It's one of the most amazing things, I think, every year when we look at our annual report, we list all the, the groups we've worked with, and it's, it's literally a page, double columned of, of groups that we've worked with over the year, and it's, it's one of the most remarkable things, I think, about how the Harris Center works and, and what a good partner we've been and, and how we treasure partnerships with other organizations. The other thing is is volunteers. Um, I think that one of the, the the page associated with citizen science talked about a thousand volunteers over the years, just in our citizen science programs. And we've had volunteers that are have been leading hikes forever, and volunteers that have been helping us with mailings forever. It's 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 an incredible number of people who have devoted in, immense amounts of time to helping the organization. I've been so impressed, even during this pandemic, when the, the buildings shut down, um, we've had volunteers uh, put up a, a chimney swift tower at the Harris Center, and we've had volunteers, I just heard today that they, uh, the blowdown, uh, last Friday there was quite a heavy thunderstorm, many of you might have experienced, and we had quite a bit of blowdown on trails, and I think we've cleaned up the last trail with, with volunteers working at appropriate social distances over the last week. So. It's really what makes the Harris Center uh, such a special place is this combination of an amazing staff and, and wonderful, wonderful volunteers and then partnerships with other organizations in, in, in the region. I'll just pipe in for a minute and um, give a nod to all the people who have been board members. Um, 
And I've worked at the hair center a long time now. And I talk with other friends that work at nonprofits. And oftentimes there's a lot of, oh, the board, oh, they do this. Oh, there's a lot of complaining. I have never felt that way about the Harris Center's board. We have been so fortunate to have such incredible board members who give their time, their energy, their heart, and their power of thinking to the Harris Center that really keeps it running. So um, we're just really grateful for all of you and all, all of you who have served in the board and maybe there's somebody out there today who's that might be something you could do in the future. So uh, hats off to the board. Terrific, thanks Susie. And then of course the, the supporters that have made all of this possible because without without supporters we, we wouldn't have the the ability to, to pay the staff and have the programs that, that make the Harris Center so special. So, um, Lisa, do you want to say something about the the 50th fund? Sure. Um, well, first, with, I just have to say with respect to the general donor population, I've worked at a number of nonprofits over the years in fundraising, and the Harris Center group of supporters is really amazing because of the loyalty. I mean, decades that people are with the organization and are giving, so it's just super impressive. And this year, in honor of our 50th anniversary, we created, we, we have created a 50th anniversary fund. And um, this fund is particularly for innovation and growth to launch us into the next 50 years. And because of the incredible generosity of our board, every single board member, and um, a group of supporters to help us get going, we have a good, solid, very solid base for this um, 50th anniversary fund. And we're gonna sort of make a, a public plea for it um, after July 1st and um, invite everybody to participate in this fund, which is going to make a lot of things possible for the future in a fantastic way. So thank you to everybody who's on in this session who has already donated and donated generously. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. So Lisa mentioned that we, this 50th fund is, is really to try and help us launch some new initiatives, launch launch into our next 50 years. And Susie, do you want to describe the, the TURTLE program that this fund has already started funding? Sure, yeah. Um, we've been working with high schoolers and um, we're really excited. We were supposed to start this year, but we'll start next year um, to start a TURTLE project where students from Conville High School's honors biology class to start with will be helping to monitor and maintain turtle habitat at McDowell Reservoir. And at the same time, um, we'll be doing some work on um, identifying what turtles are there and head starting some um, to kind of give kids a chance to take a hands-on role on helping a species um, kind of get through their first year of life and get back out into the world safely. Um, so really, really excited about that. And um, stay tuned, there'll be a lot more turtle stuff next spring and summer. And um, I'm super excited. I got turtle fever. <laughs> we get pictures of turtles every other day from Susie. I'm not sure that the, I guess the baby snappers are cute, but it's the, the painted ones that steal your heart when you see the little pictures of those babies. Um, in the upper right hand corner of this screen is a, is a really cool program that we're going to hopefully install the tower for this year. It's called a Modus Tower and it is an extraordinary thing where it's a it's a it's a uh, relatively small tower. I think less than 50 feet tall, but it is it they, uh, it's going to be a, a part of an array across the southern half of New Hampshire. Um, we're going to put a tower on some newly conserved land called the Granite Lake Headwaters land. It sort of fits in perfectly into the puzzle of the array. And the really cool thing about this is that the transmitters can be so small on the on the the critters that it's widely used for moder monitoring migration routes for, for bird species, but it can also be used on things as small as dragonflies and butterflies. And so it's really exciting to think about uh, a tower on Harris Center lands keeping track of what's migrating by, uh, even at the small scale of, of butterfly and, and dragonfly. And we will, of course, use this in our, our um, 
programs with local schools and and so it's a that's a very exciting project and then down in the lower right hand corner we've had all kinds of volunteers again out in the woods walking at, at appropriate distances looking for uh, broadwing hawk nests because we're hoping to uh, put radio transmitters on on in, in conjunction with with uh, Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania putting radio transmitters on uh, at least two hawks at least two bro at least two broad wings from uh, Harris Center Super Sanctuary lands and so that their migration routes and broadwing hawks migrate all the way down to to South America um, Uruguay Paraguay and then migrate all the way back and and these transmitters send signals um, of where the birds are at different times. So that's again, very exciting from a science perspective, but also exciting from how we can incorporate this into our education programs, looking at, at the hawk migration. And so all, th all three of those projects have, have already been funded based on this, this 50th fund that we're so excited to get, get going and help lead us, help launch our next 50 years. So a good toast to the next 50 years of the Harris Center and a huge thank you to all of you who have been supporters, volunteers, um, people in our programs, um, people who uh, spread the good word about the Harris Center and especially a big nod to Eleanor um, that I always like to think of the power of one person's heart and her intention set this all in motion and without that, we wouldn't be here and this wouldn't be happening. And the Monadnock region, I really think would look very different. And so a hats off to you, Eleanor, for all of your, um, your heart and soul in the Harris Center. Well, thank you, Susie. But I really have to acknowledge all of the thousands of people at this point who have been part of this effort. It's a group effort that goes on and it's very exciting and very rewarding. Well, that's sweet, thank you. Um, so I just wanna end by saying, um, we have lots of great stuff on our website, on our 50th tab, and um, we just have a few moments, but Miles, um, I don't know if you can call that up. We have lots of, if you wanna hear more of Mead's stories, um, he's got all of his story, a lot of his stories up there um, under Mead's, um, Tall Tales. We have an incredible, beautiful video of the origin story of the Harris Center um, that was recorded by um, or made by Salt Pro Productions or Salt Project out of Keene. Um, and it tells Eleanor's um, story about what happened, how the Harris Center came founded, became came as it is. Um, we have a photography contest. We still have events that are going on um, right now, virtual like this one. So please check out our 50th. And we have a lots of great, um, we don't typically sell stuff at the Harris Center, but we have lots of great uh, swag that commemorates our 50th from hats to shirts to stickers to the beautiful book that um, Margaret and Sandy Taylor and Brett and Lisa and myself worked on along with lots of other, um, lots of other eyes who laid on it and John Coolish's book. Um, I think checking our time, we have time for just maybe a few questions. I don't know if there's anybody who has any Harris Center questions out there and they'd like a burning question they just have always wondered about in their heart. So quiet out in the virtual world. I just have a brief comment, Susie. Uh, one of, this is Jack Calhoun. One of the things that is so extraordinary about the Harris Center is the generosity of donors over the years and the resources that that has accumulated to provide the Harris Center to do this extraordinary work, not just in education, but in, in resource protection, the, the uh, research work, and now this additional research work that you're your funding from the, the capital campaign for the 50th anniversary. It's there are very few nonprofits, and certainly in this region, that enjoy that kind of 
uh, resource strength. And it's a real tribute to everybody who's come long before me in that regard. And to, to the staff, because people put their money where they believe in things. Clearly, you all have delivered. Thank you, Jack. And, and Jack's been a board, not just on the board, but um, he's been the chair of the board. So um, he knows the ins and outs. Thank you so much for sharing that. Any other comments or questions from out there? Well, then I'll just say if you have a cup near you or your hand and you want to give a toast to the Harris Center. Oh, wait a minute. I just saw a question. I have a question. Sure. Is the property that starts on the Class 6 Road, Cricket Hill Road, that used to be Old Nelson Road, that used to belong to Edgar Seaver and went all the way down to the lake, is that owned by the Harris Center now or is it the Nature Conservancy? That's what I'm, I, I was just wondering about that. So that that land is 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 owned by something called Seaver Silver Lake Farm Trust, but the Harris Center has a conservation easement on all of it, so that it can't it can't be developed. There are a few. There's one house lot within it, but um, it's but it is Harris it's Center. Protected. It's the Harris Center, not the Nature Conservancy. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. On that lovely note, we'll have a cheers to the Harris Center and to the next 50 years. And if we were all here, we would cling cling our cups. And I want to thank all of you today for showing up tonight to hear the first 50 years. And who knows, maybe it's a bright new world and I'll see you all in the next 50 years. But thank you all for coming tonight and especially for me and Eleanor for sharing the stories of the um, family. <laughs> Cheers, cheers. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Congratulations, cheers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>